everyone. Welcome to another installment of the Buyer's Guide series from Ampro Engineering. This is a Sears Super Lobo. However, it is better known as the Nico Bison F10. The Nico Bison was sold through many retailers as many things. In this case here, it was sold as Sears with a unique body color scheme and decals as a Sears product. Sears had quite a number of vehicles called the Lobo. And Lobo, I believe, is Spanish for wolf. So you'll find quite a number of different vehicles called Lobo that don't happen to look like this vehicle. This was even sold through Radio Shack as a very, very famous RC car known as the Radio Shack Golden Arrow. Now that one had a unique body, but the, its underpinnings were in fact the Nico F10 Bison. Uh, I've also heard this car called the Rhino, and the Rhino, I think, was a later version of this with a different paint scheme, but the underpinnings are all identical. There might be some little tidbits here that are a bit different, but for the most part, this chassis lasted well into the late 1990s. Now, there are a lot of different things that happened to the vehicle over its life. And from what I have read, this vehicle was released in 1985. So in those four years, certain things were changed. This is the later model front bumper. The earlier ones were quite tubular. And this one here, it's, it's missing it's a big chunk here from the front. The thing with this car here is it was not inexpensive. If you wanted inexpensive, you would have bought its little brother, the Turbo Panther. And you can see that these two vehicles are more than slightly related. There are, I mean, the entire design of the body and this body here are practically identical. Where you are seeing some differences is that the cage in the front is in fact separate. And I'll, t I'll take the body off later, but on this vehicle here, this cage area and this body are all molded together and in this vehicle they are not but this was the 60 dollar price point vehicle that a lot of kids in the 1980s got this vehicle here was priced almost as much as a tamiya hornet or even frog with a bundled radio control and charger now you might think well who would buy this over a, a hornet or a frog and allow me to give you my assumption why people chose this over one of those vehicles now comparing the Nico Bison and the Tamiya Hornet, you can see that they're basically the same size. They're both 110 scale vehicles. What is interesting to note is that the rear wheel hub on this car is identical to the Tamiya. And arguably, the wheels and tires on the Nico may actually be better than the Tamiya ones. So perhaps on the right surface, these tires may have actually provided some better traction than the Tamiya Hornet. But that isn't why someone would have chosen the Nico over the Tamiya. The real reason why I feel that this one stood out a little more than some of the Tamiya's was because of this. Right in there, that is a mechanical speed control. And to those of you too young to know what these are, count your blessings. I need to do a video on what a mechanical speed control is because I know people watching this are going to be like, well, what is that? Why do you not like them? I will cover that very soon, I do promise. But this vehicle here does not have a mechanical speed control it has an electronic one well it really doesn't it has actually an analog board where the receiver and the speed control are clumped together to give you proportional throttle response versus the mechanical speed control which simply wasn't on the tamiya's you had three forward speeds whereas on this one here you had a much more linear throttle curve also it's not like this was a poorly made car and this one wasn't both vehicles were made by manufacturers who made incredibly high quality plastic models. So the plastics on the Nikos is second to none. It's really, really good. In fact, in, in most cases, I would say it's at Tamiya quality, which I think is a which I think is quite a compliment to Nico. There's also something else that would set this apart. Now I can't show you on my Hornet because this car has got the double wishbone front suspension, but I can show you on the Grasshopper. Whereas the Grasshopper suspension under load, you get this beautiful negative camber gain, whereas on the Nico you do not. So you press the suspension down on the Nico, and the tires stay perfectly vertical. Yes, like the Tamiya's, you've got your bump steer, but at least the tires aren't going to have camber gain as the suspension flexes over the terrain. Both the Grasshopper and the Nico do have friction-based shocks, so the cars are going to be quite a, quite bouncy, but welcome to the 1980s. Still, the front suspension design was a one-up 
on the Grasshopper, and the rear suspension design is exactly the same as the Grasshopper. Unlike the Hornet with its rolling rigid rear axle, the Bison has a central pivot point just like the Grasshopper does, and again, friction shocks. Even in terms of its cosmetics, it's a very good looking vehicle. There is a body pin here that we can remove, so I'll just pull that right out. Uh, however, it's not really going to show you anything useful. I think the main reason for this is Nico was selling replacement parts for these vehicles, so this maybe would let you change the car's body. However, it does look kind of neat without it. These are known as frame buggies, simply because the car has this exoskeleton. The rear wing is mounted independently of the main body, obviously, here. And if you are interested in one of these, it's pretty important to note that the rear wing mount area isn't the most durable. This plastic's a little bit more flexible than on its little brother. These here are perpetually snapped right off because this plastic is quite a hard... I want to say it's a PC ABS versus this is just probably just a, an ABS. So it does have more flex and these are a little bit more durable. And the good news is you can still find a good amount of spares for these cars. So they're not that hard to restore. Speaking of spare parts, oftentimes I hear that that's the main difference between hobby grade and toy grade RC cars is that hobby grade cars have the parts network for you to get replacement parts. That's not entirely true though, because Nico, Tyco, Tayo, Radio Shack, they also had availability for replacement parts. The main difference was on a lot of the lower end vehicles, people aren't going to spend $20 to replace a broken front suspension arm when the car costs 60. This vehicle was a lot more expensive, so it was a lot more inclined to get repaired. You are still going to have issues like the front suspension is held on with these pressed collars right here. In fact, that's how the rear pivot point was before I 3D printed our Ampro replacement unit, which gets rid of that. Now, even the shocks on top here have this little pressed ball. So certain things can be a little bit more difficult to take apart. But if you are interested in one of these, there is a variant of this that is a lot simpler to disassemble. And this may be a bit of a surprise to you all, but the car that you can get, which is full of screws and no weird press fit anything, is in fact known as the Traxxas Cat. Traxxas, when they first came out, specialized in kind of rebranding the higher end toy grade RC cars and funneling them through a hobby grade channel. That's why Traxxas has always been known to the uh, ready to run market is because that's what they were really good at doing. So the Traxxas Cat is basically a Nico Bison F10. What I am unaware of is how many parts are identical. I would imagine that a number of the features on the vehicle were changed to accommodate screws versus pressed pins and stuff like that. Let's investigate a little bit more on the car right now. In terms of electronics, this car did come with a two-stick radio. It came with a very similar radio to this one here. This car didn't come with one when I found it, and I was able to get this Golden Arrow radio to work. Again, walking through all that modification, there's a series of videos on that. So we'll turn that on here. It is running six AA batteries. If I can get it open right there. The car, on the other hand, not only accommodates a 7.2 volt MiCAD battery, but also requires four double A's up here to power the electronics. This again is not any kind of downside when comparing it to a Grasshopper or Hornet because one of those running a mechanical speed control is going to need a four cell receiver pack to power the electronics on that as well. So again, we're at a dead heat. What's interesting about this is that like cars with mechanical speed controls running on a receiver pack, this does not need the main battery pack to actually operate the electronics and steering. So this vehicle is fully proportional. If I push the steering just slightly, you can see that it is really nicely proportional and does have its adjustable trim right here. Unlike the lower end variants, which would have its trim down here, and not have proportional steering or throttle. I have found that the electronics on these older vehicles tends to be pretty sound. So if you are looking at getting one of these and running it, you may actually have a pretty good chance at getting them operational. I find that the worst things that go bad on this is the solder joints crack. So it's just a matter of tapping a soldering iron to the entire analog board and replacing any obviously bad capacitors. Let's plug this in. This car will absolutely run on a 2S LiPo, but just remember that there's no LiPo cutoff, obviously. So now that we've got our 
our power here. I do apply a low amount of pressure to the throttle. So we have a fully proportional throttle in this little guy as well. The motor is a 540 motor, and if anybody is thinking about replacing it with something a little bit hotter, please note that on the Nico Radio Shack, and in this case here, Sears variants, the motor is held in place with this cap at the rear. I'm not entirely certain how the cat is, but it's going to require modification to get a non closed end bell motor in there and mind the internal electronics which probably cannot support anything much hotter than this motor as a runner this car's plastics are considerably harder than the plastics used on the hornet or the grasshopper and this means that the geometry may be a little bit more consistent going over rougher terrain not that it would matter really on a car like this but you're also going to be more susceptible to breakages and this is a car where replacement parts today are maybe they're not as easy to find. You may have to get a parts car. Or you can also get yourself one of these. Now you're probably thinking, that isn't an F10. And you would be wrong. This is an F10. I mentioned earlier that this vehicle was sold almost into the 2000s through Nico, And this is how it was sold. If we stand it up a bit, we can see that the chassis are identical. Same main chassis tub here. Same transmission. I think this is, yeah, both have differentials. Even the decals are the same. What is different is if we open this up, check this out, we have a plug over where the batteries went. And that's because this car has more modern electronics and therefore it would run directly off of the main battery. Although the main chassis is the same, you are going to note if we pull the body shell off that this upper part of the chassis is bolted directly onto the bottom part of the chassis. In fact, this chassis was probably used on various other vehicles as well. Some may have even had speakers, that's why we have this. To me, it's not the only company that repurposes everything. Other companies like Nico are also very good at that. So now I'm sure you've seen some of the, the differences and highlights between this and a, and a perhaps a, a more common car like the Grasshopper or the Hornet. And you might think to yourself, okay, okay, I get it. I can see why this would be a better option than a Tamiya for certain people, but there's way cheaper options out there still in the 1980s. You could have purchased one of these. A World Engines Rockbuster or Academy Roadrunner was very inexpensive in its day. I've seen these sold as low as $49, remember, in 1980s money. And yes, you had to buy a charger, a remote, a battery pack, and you still had the mechanical speed control, which is seen here. But now we're talking about a vehicle that was around $150 to $200 versus a vehicle that as a combo may have been as cheap as $109. Why would you buy this when you can buy this for a little bit more money than this? That is a great question and fortunately I have a great answer. This is a piece of junk. For those of you who have seen the video on this vehicle, you will be completely aware that the build quality, the plastics on this vehicle are abysmal. So. I can absolutely understand why someone would not take this over the Nico. Without further ado, let's get this car running.
glass pin worked its way out. So I'm gonna go put a little dab of glue on it and hold it back in place. I want to say that the Radio Shack Golden Arrow was a little bit quicker than this, but the Golden Arrow cost a fortune. That was 300 something dollars in the 1980s. So there's a very large potential that that was a bit more upgraded than this one. I don't own one, so I can't dive into that. This was a pretty consistent speed for a vehicle of this size in that era. And remember, at the time we only had 1200 milliamp batteries. Heck, I had a thousand milliamp six cell stick pack, kind of same shape as this. I mean, even this LiPo is 1500. So the question really is, do you want this car? For the collector, that's a tough one. The only reason why a collector would want this vehicle is perhaps because they had one. I never had one as a child, so I really don't feel much of a connection to this vehicle. However, I had one of these, well, this one as a child. And because of this, because of my affinity for Nikos and Tycos and Tayo cars, that was what drew me to the F10. The issue with the F10 is that there are so many variations of this. If you are a obsessive collector, then you're going to want to get the F10. You're going to want to get the, the Rhino. There's variations on the original version of this. There's, of course, the Lobo version. You've got the Sears version. You've got the Radio Shack version. So I feel that you might want to really think things out before you end up spending way too much money. As a collector, for the most part, it's not. It's a cool piece of RC history. And light cars, you know, with the solid axle like the Grasshopper and the Hornet or, again, you have a soft spot for it, then yes, it's a good car to get. However, ask someone that wants to run this car, absolutely not. I cannot imagine any situation where you would prefer this over a Hornet or a Grasshopper. Uh, I've driven this car a couple of times and you know, it's, um, it's interesting. It definitely takes you back, but the car is weak any longer. You know, the plastics are really old. You saw that the rear shock came off in the video and that was just because this little pin here backed itself out. Nothing broke. Today in 2019 when I'm making this video, it's not a particularly enjoyable car for anybody unless for your sixth birthday or for your eighth birthday or tenth birthday, this was your birthday present. If that's the case, by all means, don't listen to me, go buy it. The runners are, are pretty inexpensive. The, the high-end ones are still not too bad. I mean, they're going to be three or four hundred dollars but a mint one of these here is going to cost you seven or eight hundred dollars so these still haven't really found their their calling yet the radios are a little bit small as well you know it's it's definitely designed for smaller hands in the event that you do want to run one of these find yourself a broken one or at least one with the electronics that are fried and swap out the electronic for something a little bit more modern this video went a little bit long, so I'm sorry I've been talking the whole time. I do hope you enjoyed this. We've got a few more videos coming up very soon. So thank you all so much for watching, and we'll see you next time.